good morning. Uh, good morning to Bart, to Bambi Grage, to uh, to Dwight Baldwin. We got some good comments. Again, I'm just I love that music, even if uh, Daniel Trevor and a bunch of others think it's old man music. You know, maybe it's because I'm an old man. Uh, <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about changing the game on obesity. Now, it's an interesting title. You know, Jesus is basically the way our content cycle, we've got several content cycles. The beginning of the content cycle is that somebody will send me something or I will just happen to see something um, because of the science reviews that I do in this space. Uh, I'll send the information, to, uh, usually an article or two or four, to uh, Jesus. Again, Jesus is a very uh, well-trained doctor in preventive medicine, so he understands a lot of, um, understands this, our space very well. But uh, Jesus and I have very different perspectives on titles. I was surprised. I didn't, I'll often get surprised when I see the title and then I see the, how, which, which content he linked. This is actually very true. It's changing the, I would have said something like a whole new paradigm for the mechanism of obesity. And it's something that many of you probably have already seen, probably have already heard, but <clears throat> maybe not. And uh, when you look at the, the reach that this channel gets now all over the world, the majority of folks have not. And so <clears throat> it's one of the underpinnings of why we really question whether or not somebody should be eating carbs. So gave you a major clue there. And it comes from the, um, a, a well-known obesity researcher at one of our better known areas or, or dispensers of quote, academic medicine, Harvard. It's a guy that does know his stuff at Harvard who's saying, hmm, you know, be careful about those carbs. And we'll talk about it. <clears throat> so uh, if you're new to our channel, we talk about the things that kill and disable people in the, in the United States and other developed countries, and in now the developing countries. Uh, despite what's going on immediately the past year or two in, econo in the economy of the world, when you look over the past 20 to 30 years, there's been major developments and those major developments have resulted in significant problems with health. Um, developing countries, which, you know, that's an old term, developing countries, less wealthy countries are now developing a lot of the health issues that the wealthier countries have. And it's related to this issue that we'll be talking about today. Speaking of topics and uh, Dr. Vega's perspective on a topic or a title and mine, a verdict on vitamin D, the vital study. So <clears throat> I would have at least put verdict in quotes because that's a very interesting uh, study. A lot of people did see it as the verdict. It's like, uh, slamming the coffin shut on vitamin D and saying vitamin D doesn't work. The reason they would say that was because it came out from the New England Journal of Medicine. Clearly, you know, most people think that it's the number one journal of medicine in the world. I don't. Uh, I think Nature Magazine has a significant edge on New England Journal, but uh, New England Journal is clearly top five, probably top three. And that article really panned uh, vitamin D. I don't think it was a verdict, though. It was, there's so many problems with that study. And um, I'm not going to go into that detail today. If you want to go through that, just uh, go and take a look at our content on that last week. Um, speaking of, <clears throat> uh, well, I wasn't speaking of this, but I will speak of bunny holes. You know, I talk about going down bunny holes uh, and people say, hey, doc, you know what? We learned the most. We learned so much from your bunny holes. Keep doing it. So that that's what I do. 
Uh, and the most popular part of these presentations are usually the bunny holes, the Q&A uh, question and answer. APOB, to me, is a major bunny hole. And here's one of the, the points that you'll see coming from me more and more in the future. That is, if you look at Peter Atia and some of the other guys that are, you know, I'm a big fan. Like I've said before, I'm a big fan of Peter Atia, uh, Day Spring, Rhonda Patrick. Um, oh, what's her name? It's not quite so academic, but I think she's doing God's work. Dr. Boz, Annette Buzzworth. Um, I'm a big fan of all of those folks and several others. I've actually seen content that I really like out of, believe it or not, Eric Berg and, and Joe Mercola. Both of them have some really good content. But with every one of them, I have major disagreements in some places. For example, you know, uh, Rhonda Patrick, who's really good academically. And you might say, how could you have an ar argument with Rhonda Patrick? Well, Rhonda, you know, is a big fan of saunas. I'm a big fan of saunas as well. But when you actually look at the data, the evidence, it's not at all that clear. And again, you know, that's not something that, that you hear from Rhonda and other big fans. Uh, I've done a couple of videos on the real evidence behind saunas. And again, it's not great. I'm still a big fan uh, of Dr. Patrick's and I'm a big fan of saunas. So now let's get back to APOB and cardiovascular risk. Although, I, yes, I'm a fan of APOB. I look at it but I am not nearly as big a fan of just focusing on APOB like uh, Thomas Dayspring or Peter Atia and some of the other folks that Peter's had on his channel because it's just not that important. There are other things that are far more important, but anyhow, we go into some of those details on APOB. And one of our, you know, key topics, stress tests don't predict heart attacks. We had that yet again, and it keeps coming back over and over and over again. In fact, one of the key questions before even starting the show today, somebody is saying, what's the best way to evaluate cardiovascular risk? Is it an EKG? Well, <clears throat> I'll give you the short answer on that one. <clears throat> no, it's not an EKG. It's not a stress EKG. It's not a, a nuclear stress test. In fact, I think that's a good transition. Pardon me. <clears throat> Hopefully I won't get into one of those coughing spells. By the way, for those of you who are uh, knowledgeable and interested, I'm just not taking an ACE inhibitor anymore. <clears throat> uh, I have too many allergies and I've gone back to an ARB, which is almost as good but it's not quite as good as an ACE. Why did I say that? Uh, just look up ACE inhibitors and cough. So let's go back to what I was talking about. Evaluation of cardiovascular risk and specifically plaque. Do I have plaque? If I do, what are the ways of evaluating it? So as you see, that's one of four courses we have here. And this is what we're all about helping people understand what their risk is for being for death and disability. The number one, two, three causes of death and disability in our world today, heart attack, stroke, um, some cancers and a whole bunch of um, dementia, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease. It's the vessels that, that supply oxygen to the tissues that need it, like our brain for Alzheimer's, like our kidneys for kidney disease, like our um, eyes, the back of our eyeballs, the retina, um, all, all of those things, um, believe it or not, those are cardiovascular disease as well. And believe it or not, the biggest cause for any of those items I just listed is also the biggest cause for heart attack, insulin resistance, diabetes, pre-diabetes. Um, the uh, most full-blown diabetes is not diagnosed. 
And, and now the CDC is not too clear on that, but even the CDC is very clear on the fact that the vast majority of prediabetes or insulin resistance is not diagnosed either. You know, the CDC will say, well, by the time we're age 60, two thirds of us have it, but 90% don't know about it. <clears throat> That's a pretty good number, but it's old. If you go to the JAMA studies and some uh, really good, really reliable uh, evidence. Um, it's not at age 60, it's by age 30, and it's not a third, it's a half. By the time we're age 30, half of us have some significant insulin resistance. And we wonder why so many of us have plaque and where it's coming from. So I've touched, I've, uh, I have touched base on a couple of core topics here. Evaluation of plaque, insulin resistance, uh, cardiovascular inflammation. That's where we basically burn our arteries because our blood sugar remains too high for too long, day after day after day. Those are the real processes that drive cardiovascular risk. And then there's another course that's... Um, that goes into the depth and breadth. It's like a nine hour course. And the, the bottom line is we'll give this to you for free. If you, uh, if you'll just look at it, spend a couple hours on it and you'll know more about how to prevent your own heart attack and stroke and blindness and erectile uh, dysfunction and Alzheimer's and all those things we talked about. You'll know more about how to prevent those than your doctor does. Uh, we're, I'm going to go down another quick bunny hole. I, I'm a public health guy at heart, so I want to provide this kind of, of care to more and more people. We are gearing up with um, Medicare, uh, bringing on Medicare patients in the state of Florida as we speak. And um, one of the things that we want to do is make this information available, make this care available and help people prevent heart attack and stroke. I was talking with one of the patients, we were doing an AWV yesterday and I was making sure that the pre-AWV process was going correctly. I asked him a couple of things about, uh, about it and he said, look, you know what? My primary care doctor just retired. I went to a cardiologist, I went to an internist, uh, a fam no, two internists, a family practitioner. Prevention never occurred in anybody's vocabulary except yours. So that's true. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I used to run the prevention program at Johns Hopkins. I trained doctors at Johns Hopkins in preventive medicine. And one of the things we looked at was the manpower situation. This was like, gosh, 20 and 30 years ago, out of every 500 people, Le less than two went into true prevention. Now you see a lot of people uh, that say they do prevention on the internet. You see a lot of docs that say, well, oh, I just do prevention as part of my cardiology, part of my family medicine. And they weren't trained in it. That's sort of like me doing orthopedics. Um, you know, I practice as an ER doc and you have to do a little bit of orthopedics as an ER doc, but you should not be doing, holding out a, can, a, a, a shingle saying, I do orthopedics. And unfortunately, that's what goes on because there's so few trained preventive docs. Uh, your primary care doctors basically say, well, I do that. Now, the result, uh, <clears throat> the, the result is very, very clear. Uh, my my peers at Hopkins, as well as now other places like uh, Mayo, Harvard, have all begun to show the same thing. Two thirds of the primary care uh, providers in the United States, supposedly the best uh, healthcare manpower group in the world, not the best health outcomes, because they don't know prevention. And two thirds of them, do not know how to diagnose insulin resistance, let alone how to manage it. So again, it's caveat emptor, you know, buyer beware. Um, 
if you're depending on your primary care doc to know what he or she needs to know to guide you into preventing disease, you need to just stop, take some time. Uh, it's a couple hours. These are eighth grade level uh, uh, courses and you can get them for free. Just let us know if you need help. Um, speaking of our content, you can reach it on YouTube. Uh, uh, YouTube now has a, um, YouTube was our primary and still is our primary outlet, uh, but you, you can uh, even do memberships now. The memberships actually help us get this information, life-saving information all over the world. Um, that's one of the reasons, the major reason that we moved our weekly show to an hour earlier because there was a lot of demand in Asia to be able to join live. Uh, <clears throat> so if you can join the uh, YouTube cha uh, channel membership, that would be fantastic. We've had a lot of people joining recently. It helps us get that information out. It helps us save lives. If you're not a YouTuber kind of uh, guy or gal and you're more into locals and rumble, we have those now. Um, and those have been, that's, those are actually our fastest growing outlets. Um, now, again, I mentioned the, the, um, the major transitions that we're having and our major focus right now is, is providing access to our care through, um, through Medicare. We thought the subscriptions would go away. Mm -mm, not at all. In fact, the subscriptions are likely to increase. And that's going to be more for people who uh, don't have Medicare yet, uh, don't have Medicare for one reason or another, and uh, actually will end up working well uh, with the Medicare programs. Uh, more to be decided and more to be uh, described as we get there. Now I'm going to talk about the book today. I'll save you some inf some. Uh, some time on that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about evidence today. And uh, this is the last study that we, I mean, the last slide that I developed for the show last week, the quote verdict on vitamin D uh, that came out in the uh, vital study in the New England Journal. Uh, as I said, uh, I used air quotes just now, and I would have used quotes in that title if I'd thought about it a little bit more, um, because uh, this is one of the most important things to think about, to look at, and one of the Im most important things that we do in this channel. Yes, we focus on uh, heart attack and stroke prevention, but <clears throat> one of the things that we do is just not shared very much in YouTube. And it has to do with this. When I was at Hopkins, I was a, an, what's called an epidemiologist. Uh, the difference between a, I'm a physician, but, and the difference between a typical physician's view of what's going on is that that doc is looking at what, what they know or think they know about an individual patient. I do individual patient work because I am a physician, but as an epidemiologist, it's rooted in what you might expect, study of epidemics. In other words, it's looking at diseases as they happen in large populations. And once you start, it, it involves statistics, it involves probability, it involves logic, some things that you just don't find in medical school, just like you don't find discussions of diet, just like you don't find very much discussion of prevention. You also don't find information about epidemiology. So your typical doc, your typical person distributing, quote, studies on Internet and YouTube doesn't realize some of the information uh, that's presented in this study. And this study is like one of the landmarks for epidemiology. It was uh, by a physician, epidemiologist at Stanford named John I'm going to butcher it, uh, Ioannidis. Obviously, it's a Greek uh, uh, last name. Why most published research findings are false. It is by far the most accessed article in PLOS, the Public Library of Science, ever. And uh, it's, you know, it sounds like an editorial, but when you go in and you actually read it, no, it is like the anthem, the flag bearer, uh, 
article of the epidemiologist. And, you know, it makes a point. You, you hear this stuff all the time about uh, statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics. I can tell you, one of the things that you first find when you get deeper and deeper into epidemiology is that that's wrong. Statistics do lie. How can that be? They're not, uh, you know, they're, they're not humans. They're not sentient beings. H here's the issue. The vast majority of information that's put out in front of people as, quote, science or articles is based on assumptions, assumptions that were not recognized by the study authors, assumptions that really make the study findings suspect. But most of the time, it's I can argue whether it's most of the time, but mo well, clearly most of the time, Everybody bring, uh, uh, let me just go back and try to set up a better qualifier. It's clear knowledge that we all have our biases. If you think that you're a human being and you do not have a bias, mm, this is probably not a good channel for you. You probably need to go back to square one. Um, <clears throat> so when you consider the fact that every one of us has biases, now start thinking about, okay, you put these people in academic areas, you put them in a place where it's called publish or perish. So now they have to find things that the rest of the world doesn't know. Because if it's something like, oh, I have a scientific theory that everybody has, that most people have two legs. Well, that's not going to get published anywhere. It's got to be something that people don't expect, but you found it out and now you're proving it. All of a sudden, you're now into high probability of bias, low probability of true hypotheses. And so what you begin to see is, yeah, the, the statistics actually do lie. There's a thing called uh, Bayesian probabilities, and that's what r studies really are. Bayesian means the probability of something given the bias that you approached that situation with. And most... Uh, academic researchers don't even think about that. And clearly, like 99 times out of 100 doctors or other, quote, scientists that are reading an article don't think about the pre-existing biases that happen. So it's not the, the concept that uh, statistics don't lie. You, but liars use statistics. Uh, that's not the issue. It's actually usually the opposite. Most, most researchers mean well, have uh, appropriate ethical, um, ethical goals. Not all. I'm not being naive, but most do. The bottom line, though, is they don't recognize the uh, Bayesian probability or the fact that they're bringing biases to the table. And when they don't, the statistics actually do lie more so than the liars. Um, <clears throat> so maybe there's a better term that um, to think about in terms of looking at science, and that is lies, damn lies, and statistics. I hope I didn't lose too many of you. Well, actually, I didn't. We're continuing to grow in terms of our uh, of our content. Now, having said all this thing about most. Um, most studies are wrong. Most published studies are wrong. I'm going to spend the rest of our time uh, on the short content and long time content talking about studies. And so, <clears throat> again, that's what I do. Uh, and when I look at a study, I'll give you my perspective on what biases are uh, potential there and which ones aren't. Um, this one is flu shot and stroke risk. You know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm not going to take this vaccine. I'm not going to take that vaccine. And you got a lot of that with um, 
COVID vaccine, which I'm not going to get into because it has become such a political hot topic. I mean, it just, when you make a vaccine political the way that has, you're basically uh, demonstrating something, which I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now and get to the, the script for today. Flu shot and stroke risk. Objective, assess the relationship between influenza vaccine and the risk of first ischemic stroke. Why? Because people were worried that it may cause stroke. There's a very strong anti-vaxxer group uh, out there. When I, whenever I talk about vaccines and it's in the title, I'll usually get dogpiled. I will get two to 10 or more anti-vaxxers who come on and they just, you know, they try, when I say dogpile, they just put stupid questions and statements in the Q&A session and we have to bump them off in order to have a real rational discussion about the facts. So as you see, we're talking a little bit about a vaccine today, but we certainly didn't put it in the title because of that issue, the dog pilers. Now, <clears throat> does influenza a vaccine actually cause stroke? There was, they did a nested case control study in a Spanish primary care database over 2001 to 2015. The cohort consisted of more than 3 million subjects aged 40 to 99. This was in neurology September of this year, just a month ago. The study selected 14,322 uh, incident ischemic stroke cases. Again, that sounds, that's a huge number. And you go back to Ioannidis' article. This is, this is one of the, he talks about how Quite often, like we did in the vital study, they said they had tens of thousands of participants, but when you actually looked at it, they really didn't have that many, um, many people in, this, in the study group because they had vitamin D levels on very, very few. This is not like that. This has got a lot of study participants and uh, you, would, you would look at this and you would say, well, maybe they didn't have that many strokes. No, they had 14,322. And so plenty of cases to compare to controls. And so in a nested case control study like this, you often go back and say, we've got a lot more controls. Let's pick the cases and then do three to four times the number of controls. And that's exactly what they did. 71,610 controls. Flu shot was identified for 41% and 40.5% respectively. So that gives you a little bit of comfort that there was not some sort of selection bias going on between cases and controls. The fact that the flu shot was identified in a, almost the same percentage of folks coming in. If it had been very different, then you'd have to stop and say, wait a minute, there's some sort of participation bias going on that we don't understand and you'd have to dig into that. You, with numbers that close, you don't have to worry about that as much. You have to worry about everything, but not that as much at this point in the study. Vaccinated subjects had higher prevalence of vascular risk disease as a background. In other words, uh, if anything, you'd expect vaccinated people to be more likely to have a stroke because the people that got vaccinated were more likely to already have some cardiovascular risk. Now, why is that? Same thing that you saw, for example, with, uh, with COVID vaccine. People 65 and older were much more likely to get vaccinated quicker and more often than younger people. I suspect that's the same issue going on here. So if you see a higher stroke rate, then mm, you got to go back and compare those numbers. But that's not what you saw. You actually saw a lower stroke rate for people that were vaccinated, even though those same people had more risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So that study, you know, it's a study, just like uh, everything else, it's not perfect. And there's a lot to, there's always a lot to question in any study. But we're humans, we have limited information, we have to make our choices. You've heard me say this 
uh, before about other vaccines, which uh, will not be named right now. Yes, there are risks on influenza vaccine, just like there are risks with other vaccines. But as for me, what am I going to do? This is yet another piece of information that I think uh, continues to weigh the thing over to, I'm getting my flu vaccine. And guess what? I already had it. I had it a week and a half ago. And guess what else? I also had my COVID vac uh, update, my booster. Is that one critical? I, that one's not as critical, but uh, at, at least for a lot of uh, younger people, lower risk people, but for high, higher risk people, I think that one's a, well, I voted with my feet. I got both of those vaccines. Now, uh, when, um, when Aspen gives us the water ball, we'll go into the content, the major content for today, the long form, changing the game on obesity. So, as I said, we're going to talk about a very, very uh, good researcher named David Ludwig. He's at Harvard. He is an endocrinologist. He has run the, uh, the obesity clinic there. So, uh, you can say, I mean, you, you know, there could be a political appointment or politically driven, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I have a bunch more information, including the fact that I've read his book, Always Hungry. And it's a good book. I don't agree with everything he says in there. Somebody actually read it recently and said, Ford, I don't think it. Uh, oh, so for example, there's one thing that I don't agree with. It. I'm, I'm going to give a qualified, uh, give a plug for his book, Always Hungry, but it's qualified. Uh, one of my patients said, you know, I read that book. I heard your plug on it. And I don't think he says what you say. And I said, what was that? And he said, well, he was talking about a Mediterranean diet. And no, I don't agree with a Mediterranean diet unless you uh, have a, a Mediterranean diet where you've taken out the grain products and, you know, the other major sources of carbs. And he should know that. But again, that's a that's not a new book. It's fairly old, uh, back when people written back when people were questioning the Mediterranean diet less. I'll also say I don't really beat up on any diet, whether it comes from the, the Mediterranean, whether it comes from plants, whether it comes from animals, you name it. My concern is whether or not you're eating a lot of carbs. I'm not concerned about whether or not whether where those macros come from. And you'll see in the rest of this discussion for the long form content today, why I say that and why I agree with his comment. His book and Robert Lustig's book, don't confuse the two. They're both endocrinologists. They both are working in academic centers. They are both into the uh, insulin mechanism of obesity. They are both uh, researchers. One's on the East Coast. One on one's on the left, uh, the left coast, uh, UC San Francisco, and they have very similar last names. So it's easy to, con to confuse these guys. David Ludwig is at Harvard, and he wrote "Always Hungry." Uh, Robert Lustig is uh, at UC San Francisco, I believe, and he wrote. Um, white and deadly. What was it? Crystalline, white and deadly about sugar. Uh, he does a lot of stuff. He's got a lot more books out there. And some of his, he's got a uh, more focus on fructose. Uh, he, both of them have good content. Like I said earlier, I don't agree a hundred percent with either of them, just like I don't agree a hundred percent with anybody. Um, but some really, really good content. And I'm going to cover some of his content today because he did a good article on the model explaining weight gain and obesity. 
And here's the thing. If you go back to Gary Tabbs's books, he covers it very well also. He says, you know, we think that as we're getting older, we're getting fatter because we're eating more. One of his books is called Good Calories, Bad Calories. It's very similar to a shorter book called Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. And his point is, we don't get fat because we're eating more. We're eating more because we're getting fat. Now the question is, why are we getting fat? This will talk about it. So back to this to the script for today. The new model on obesity, uh, David Ludwig, professor at Harvard uh, School of Public Health, wrote the book Always Hungry. He challenges the traditional obesity model based on energy balance. He published an article last year regarding the new obesity model, and that's basically what we're covering. It's energy-based versus carbohydrate insulin model. This was in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition 2021. So again, as I talked with you earlier about our uh, one of our major, the first cycle of our content cycle, it's me reading through stuff. And I happened to see this title, read the article and, and sent it to Jesus and said, yeah, we need to cover that. So here's the thing. The traditional view is that the obesity pandemic is caused by overconsumption of modern, highly palatable, in other words, it tastes good, processed, energy-dense foods exacerbated by sedentary lifestyle. It's, we're sitting around a lot and eating Twinkies. Despite persistent focus on eating less and moving more, there was a book, Eat More, Move Less. No, <laughs> Eat Less, Move More, and uh, Eat, Move, and Sleep. Obesity rates remain higher than ever. Because it's not just eat how much you eat, how many calories you're getting. There's something else going on. Conceptualizing obesity based in the energy balance model just hasn't worked. Like I said, there's something else going on. And, you know, it's, it's always something. And in this case, take a look at the endocrine impact of what's going on. The hormones. Leptin and ghrelin to a large extent, but mostly insulin. The carbohydrate insulin model proposes a reverse causal direction. In other words, that's what you hear in Gary Tobbs' books. It's not that we're eating or getting fat because we're eating more. It's that we're eating more because we're getting fat. So what does this mean? The relationship between the energy intake and use is the same as the energy balance model. You eat more and you're going to start weight. You're going to get heavier. But the real question, the thing that the uh, CIM, the carbohydrate insulin model, brings to the table is not questioning that we're eating more. It's true that we are. But the difference is the root. To the, you know, even on that statement, there are some qualifications and I'm not going to go down that bunny hole because it's a little too, too detailed for the scope, the level at which we're covering this. So, yes, there's an energy balance. There is truth to that, but that's not the problem. The root cause of the problem is why we eat more. And that's insulin resistance. The carbohydrate insulin model proposes that hormonal and metabolic responses to dietary calories trigger the obesity pathway. Now, I'll give you one more second to memorize that whole flow. Basically, I'm being facetious, obviously. Basically, what we're saying is you eat a high glycemic diet, your blood, uh, blood sugar goes way up. Then in order to manage that blood sugar going way up, you trigger insulin. Well, you get a big insulin load, uh, following a, a carb load and hyperglycemia, hyper too much glyce, uh, glu glucosemia in the blood, hyperglycemia, too much glucose in the blood. You get a big increase in that uh, insulin, then it starts taking it back down. These, this roller coaster effect of blood sugar causes the body to start telling you, I'm hungry. I'm hungry again. 
number one, I want to sleep to, and that's your body. You know, after an hour or so after carbs, you tend to get fuzzy headed. You want to rest, relax and sleep. Uh, that's because your body's saying, yeah, we took on a big bunch of, of calories here. I need to, I need you to sleep so I can put those in energy storage, the fat tissues. You also tend to get hungry again pretty soon after that. That's because you're on that carb and blood glucose roller coaster. So over the long term, a shift in substrate partitioning favoring fat storage drives obesity. Uh, substrate partitioning fav favoring fat storage. You know, uh, like I said, Jesus is like me. He's a you know highly technically trained doctor. But what does that mean? What that what that means? Substrate is the energy that our body's taking in. Partitioning, that's the key point. Partitioning, favoring fat storage. In other words, over the long term, we can use that energy and go this direction, or we can store that energy and go this direction, put it in fat. And that's what the whole thing about the uh, CIM, the carbohydrate uh, uh, insulin model is all about. It's saying, yeah, it's all for both of them. Energy balance is, is, is true, but it's what's going on with the energy balance. If you're eating a lot of carbs, you're going you know, this way. You're putting all that energy into fat. And because you're putting that into fat, you get hungry more and you need to eat more. If you're not eating a lot of carbs, you're not on that glucose roller coaster. You're not getting as hungry as often. And so you're using that energy instead of putting it into fat stores. So you don't have to eat as much because you're not storing everything as fat. So the point behind all this is fairly simple. It doesn't have to do with APOB. It do, and this is the biggest issue that we have worldwide uh, in terms of our health. And if you want to say, okay, Ford, you're getting too global. Okay, in the U.S. wide. Okay, Ford, maybe you're still too global. I can tell you among the patients that I see. And it's not just patients that see. Walk down the street, look at a, a picture of people on the street in the 1930s versus now. Now we are heavier. People think that a BMI of 22 is too skinny and unhealthy. Why? Because we have gotten hammered as a population by eating high dietary glycemic loads. It's put us on that roller coaster and we're just eating more. The average increase in body weight is attributable to storage of less than one gram of extra fat per day. You know, we're not you're, you're not going to pick up grams on your uh, body um, scale. This is a very small amount, but there's a 365 days in a year and those less than a gram per day adds up. The uh, carbohydrate insulin model doesn't provide a complete representation of all causal mechanisms. Uh, again, that's where we do go down some more detailed bunny holes. But uh, again, uh, this is a, an article, JAMA 2018, from a U.S. group talking about consumption of sugary foods, which in turn affects the substrate partitioning. That's what we just talked about. Through calorie-independent mechanisms, and they drive fat accumulation. So another comment about that is it's not how, what they showed in this article was that it's not about the amount of calories. It's about the type of calories and consuming sugary foods, carbohydrate laden foods starts that goes to that partition and starts you into energy storage, not energy burn. And the energy storage makes you hungry again. So uh, if you'll give us the, uh, the transition, Aspen. Aspen's covering us today. Thank you so much. Aspen, if you'll give us that transition, we'll go into Q&A. So there we go.
Oh, gosh, we've got a lot of interest today. Dwight Baldwin. Let me see if I can show this here. Hello, Dr. Brewer. I was talking to my doctor, and I was told that most testing facilities no longer offer microalbumin creatinine ratio studies, only albumin creatinine ratio studies. I haven't seen that. And in fact, you know, I saw what six patients yesterday after well, yesterday morning and afternoon, and most of them had microalbumin creatinine from the uh, national lab that we use, Quest. We get a lot of folks that use LabCorp, maybe five percent, because LabCorp is not really quite as good at organizing this information correctly, but both of those are looking at microalbumin creatinine ratio. So I would suggest to your doc, I started to look that up, Dwight, before the show, and then things happened. <laughs> if I could share, you guys don't want to hear me complain about all the stuff that happened. I ended up going to the bank for some confusion, banker confusion and cash flow issues related to our transition into uh, <clears throat> into the uh, uh, the Medicare project, and you know Medicare actually is going to be a strain on us financially. We'll do fine, but it's going to be sort of like that dip and you know some of that roller coaster business. And so I ended up getting sucked into that, and didn't get a chance to do a little bit more work on that. I, all I can do is tell you my experience. I have not seen that, Dwight. So maybe you're uh, Doc can check up a little bit deeper on, on his facts. Uh, Bambi Grage, good morning. Made it on time. Yep. Thank you so much, Bambi. And I appreciate you mentioning it. For those of you who are not catching on, we're starting now at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, U.S. time. We used to start at 11. The reason we moved it up was because we had a lot of demand from Asia to be able to attend live. Okay. Now, Bambi goes, and Bambi's uh, been off and on with us for a long time, brought up, I think, Bambi, were you, weren't you the one that brought up uh, one of the original comments about K2? And I, because of that, assuming it was you, I ended up doing a video which took me into a big bunny hole about K2, a whole series, about 12 videos on it. It's a little bit of a difficult, confusing picture especially when you do what I do and actually look at the evidence. Anyhow, Bambi says, I have a friend who had an EKG and his doctor told him he may have had a previous heart attack and may have, have blockage. Which tests should he get next to confirm these? Let's break some of this up. Told him he may have had a previous heart attack. I'll tell you what, despite the, the, the fact that doctors know that uh, diabetes is extremely uh, strong as a risk factor. They don't, they tend to not understand that it's a stronger risk factor than uh, LDL. That's one of the major assumptions, uh, problems that you see in the physician culture these days. They're getting it. They're beginning to understand that cardiovascular inflammation is a bigger deal. But it's like, you know, they mentioned that, what, over 10 years ago, it was on the cover of one of the cardiology uh, workday magazines. And, uh, but then even 10 years later, one of the articles came out from Paul Ridker looking at which one was it? I mean, he's done a series of articles on cardiovascular inflammation. Uh, 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 the the uh, Waskoff studies, um, the Jupiter trials, those were like 20 years ago. And more recently, he's done things like Compass. He's taken things like uh, an orphan drug used for inflammation for juvenile arthritis. He gave it to people all over the world and it decreased heart attack and stroke. Uh, you don't see it being used because it's one of these quarter of a million dollar uh, super modern drugs. But here's why I'm going down that bunny hole. Bunny hole. Um, you, you saw cardiologists in these meetings all over the world and they, they, they would be interviewed about it. And they said, well, you know, we've been talking about inflammation as a cause of heart attack and stroke, but this just caught us flat-footed. We, 
uh, we knew there was something to it, but we really didn't know there was anything you could do about it. Hmm. Makes your head hurt. Uh, anyhow, so inflammation is a much stronger cause of heart attack and stroke than LDL. LDL sometimes causes inflammation, but more when you get into the 180 and above the FH, familial hypercholesterolemia range. Um, but EKG is not really going to help you on that. Uh, you do have a lot of things called silent heart attacks, and they are very they're found more often in people that have diabetes than not. So if he's had a silent heart attack, you know, I'm going to say even more so what I say to everybody. I know I go down a lot of bunny holes. I know I talk about a lot of technical stuff like selection bias, et cetera. Bottom line, get your cholesterol, I mean, get your uh, OGTT studies done, oral glucose tolerance even better yet, get a, an insulin survey because doctors, no matter which doctor you you're talking to, they all know that diabetes causes this problem. They just don't know how to diagnose diabetes. And as we just said, said before, two thirds of them can't diagnose even prediabetes. And guess what? Maybe that's got something to do with the fact that 90% of people with insulin resistance, diabetes and prediabetes don't even know. So have your patient, have your friend first get an insulin survey. Don't stop, don't pass go, go straight to an insulin survey. What test did he get to confirm these? Don't worry about confirming those. Worry about confirming your carb metabolism first. Then you can go into plaque evaluation. And so I'm going to give you a, now I'm going to get out of that diatribe, that rant on, you know, it sounds like another doctor missing diabetes, prediabetes, and even to the point where you've got a major red flag, a potential silent MI. That happens with diabetes. Big deal. And I'm worried that the doctor's missing it. And guess what? The reason I'm worried, I don't mean to badmouth the doctor and assume badly. I'm just looking at statistics. That is what happens. Most doctors are missing these things and they're happening. And it's not that I'm angry that the doctor's missing it. I'm not angry that I worked with doctors. I supervise doctors. I know why they make mistakes. I'm worried about your friend, the patient. This is putting his life at risk, and he needs to find out what the root cause is. Very, very simple logic. Uh, I, who is it? Was it Einstein that was given the, that is often attributed to this with this quote? Um doing the same thing over and over again and expecting better results is, you know, the definition of insanity. Another very famous quote, and I don't remember who's given credit for it, but if you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole, first stop digging. And that's the problem here. Don't worry quite so much about evaluating that plaque and his risk. You're going to find out more about his risk if you get him to get an insulin survey or at least an OGTT, to see how he's metabolizing those carbs, to see if he's burning up his arteries. We know he's burning up his arteries because he's, he's got plaque. Don't know that 100% sure, but given what you're telling me, I think the, the probability is probably 95% or greater that, yes, he's got plaque. If he's got plaque, that means he's been through episodes of cardiovascular inflammation. If he's got cardiovascular inflammation, the most likely cause, hands down, is insulin resistance. Now, you can say, well, Ford, you're, you're ignoring all these other causes like LP little a, like Bob Harper had, like uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, like other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not ignoring those. Cardiovascular disease is a multifactorial risk issue. Almost always people have more than just one risk factor. But the people that come in with FH, they've had that all their lives and high LDLs all their lives. People with rheumatoid arthritis, they've had that all their lives. People with high LP little a, they've had that all their lives. Why are they still tending to get their heart attacks after the age of 50? It's because they're becoming insulin resistant and now the lining of the artery can't protect itself anymore from these other risk 
factors. Now, I said I was done with that rant a minute ago and I kept on. And so I'm done with that rant about making sure that he doesn't, looking at root cause, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes. Which tests should he get to evaluate the plaque? Here's a 30 second uh, version of that course on plaque evaluation. Hey doc, I am having some problems. I'm worried about risk. Why don't we get a stress test? Famous last words, literally famous last words, you know, go read the Tim Russert story. Read my book. It starts with the Tim Russert story. That's exactly what he said. He passed the stress test with flying colors and then he died from a heart attack. So, uh, you know, let's get the message here. Stress test is not the way to do this. And guess what? This is not just me ranting and raving on uh, YouTube. The uh, boards of internal medicine, the College of Internal Medicine, the College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, all of them are saying the same things. Even the standards committees, which are just slow, tend to be a decade behind. Even they are saying, you're doing way too many stress tests. And it's because they don't predict heart attack and stroke. I wrote that book on it. Get the book. It's not as bad as I keep saying it is. Um, so the typical, the, the typical way of evaluating a heart attack and stroke risk is first you start with a, what's called a, um, uh, oh, somebody help me out here. I just had a major um, word finding issue. It's the, um, the something risk factor uh, risk calculator. And the doc thinks that he's doing it, but he's doing it in his head. Do they smoke? How old are they? Do they have diabetes? Do they have high LDL? And the doc's really not doing a complete uh, survey on that. And somebody down below is knowing exactly the word I'm blanking on and helping me with it, but we'll get there a little bit later. So don't do the, um, ah, that part, and then let's get a stress test, and then let's go to the cath lab. That's the unholy a triumvirate that everybody's going down and it's a slippery slope to getting a stent. Stents aren't that dangerous, believe it or not, but 90% of them are done to prevent heart attacks. The other 10% are actually saving lives after the heart attack. The problem with uh, those 90% of, of stents that are done to prevent a heart attack is that the research is really clear. The Orbiter trial, the Courage trial, the uh, ischemia trial, all are very clear that plumbing does not prevent heart attacks. So don't go that, that route. Um, that evaluation that I'm blanking on, followed by a stress test, followed by a cath lab, followed by a stent. Just don't do that. Do this instead. Calcium score or CIMT or CT angiogram. Now, the standards committees love to beat up on CIMT. I understand completely why. There's a garbage in, garbage out, but that's when you're looking at things like arterial age and stuff like that. Those are great. They're catchy. They're easy to understand. But what is not garbage in, garbage out, it's very standardizable. There's, it's as standard, standardizable as, um, as a calcium score, and that is looking at calcium in the plaque. In other words, is your plaque uh, soft or hard, is your plaque inflamed? That's easy on a CIMT. And that CIMT um, component, do you have soft plaque? That's what you want to look for. That beats out CT angiogram and, uh, and calcium score. Now, calcium score, people talk about the risk associated with um, Radiation, that's not, that's not a valid concern. Put that out of your mind. The only problem with cal calcium score is better than going down this uh, stress test route. Uh, so is CT angiogram. And again, so is CIMT. Um, the only problem with calcium score is that it doesn't really show you soft plaque. Now, CT angiogram is still very early. The CT angiograms that have been done so far are not, uh, have not, been good for showing uh, soft plaque, but they're getting there. I got 
I went off on a long tangent, went maybe really fast, and hopefully it wasn't too organized. I hope that helped, Bambi. Bart Robinson, very good morning to everyone. Good morning to you as well, Bart. Uh, oh, I was just saying I love my old man music. Uh, good morning, Brad. Good morning, Tim. Everyone from North Carolina. Thank you. Bart, nothing wrong with the music, but I'm the same age as you. <laughs> Don't call me old. Okay. I'm a 65-year-old old man, and you're a 65-year-old young man. Desitivity. Morning, Doc. Any ballpark on when you'll undertake Medicare in Georgia? Oh, you know, Georgia is going to be the next state, Desitivity. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, Dr. Vega and I were talking about that just a couple of days ago. He's ready to start expanding into Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama. Um, it's the guys on the enrollment side. And the enrollment has to do with we have to get enrolled in the Medicare plan, which is easy, but it's all the Medicare Advantage plans, which, you know, for Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, for Aetna, for, you know, just the others. And there's four times those than there is for straight Medicare. If you're straight Medicare, that should be fairly quick. I, you know, I hesitate to guess, but I'd say clearly within a month. Uh, so keep us posted. If your name is not in the list, um, Aspen, if you'll show the number, call this number, uh, Desitivity, and get on the list. Or you can go to the website. Hey, Aspen, one thing we need to do is, is do a little banner where we can show people how to get to that website to register uh, gets to get on the list to register for Medicare. John Kukaba, Kusaba, where to get a CIMT in Southwest Florida? Uh, there's a lot of really good CIMT sources in Florida. Uh, keep that number up if you would, Aspen. Just call that number, John. You should be able to get a good, uh, a good focus there or a good source there for Florida. LPG, one, two, three, three, eight, nine dollar super chat, ten dollar super chat. Thank you so much, LPG, a frequent contributor, frequent super chatter and a, uh, someone who knows a lot about uh, some. Um, some supplements, especially this one, obviously a big fan of nano back uh, ticks, arterial soul and Indicalix Pro. Very interesting paperwork on them. Also very informative video. Thank you so much, LPG. Brad, question on macros. I understand low carb, but still fuzzy on the ratio between healthy fats and proteins. Oh, uh, you know what? Well, let me just stop right there, Brad. You are not the only person who's fuzzy on that. The evidence is fuzzy. And when you see people say they know just shake your head and, turn, and close your ears because they don't. The evidence is just not that clear. Having said all that, it doesn't stop me from having an opinion. Uh, I, you know, I've had this conversation, what? I had it a half dozen times over the past week. Uh, you get a few people who get going on a keto diet. They uh, lose their, this, uh, some of this problem with weight, they lose body fat. And that's a big, big deal. It's the most important thing that we uh, want to do in terms of managing our health in this space, cardiovascular health. But then they start losing too much weight. And then one of the questions is, how do you maintain weight uh, if you're on a low carb? I won't spend much time on that because not many people have it, but more and more people are getting there. Number one, the most common issue is to take a look. I haven't had anybody at a BMI of 17 that I can remember that came to me with this problem. The two that came this week had BMIs of 22 and 20. And the point was everybody's telling them they're too skinny and they need to gain weight. BMI of 20 or 22 is not too skinny. When people tell you you look sick, Tell them that they don't know what sick looks like. Ignore that. That's the most common issue that I'll say about this whole thing of uh, weight loss and carbs. Why did I go here? Bec based on your question, because then we get into this question of, 
Okay, so if you're if you're lowering the glass, lowering the glycemic index and lowering your carbs, oh, what do you do in terms of that balance of fats and protein? Again, it's a mixed story. I tend to get more protein than most folks say. The American, the U.S. diet has a lot more access to protein. There's a lot more focus on protein. And a lot of people would say, well, it helps manage your appetite. I personally find that that's true, at least with me. I don't know that that's true with everybody. And again, I will tell you, this is an item that's incredibly interesting to me. It doesn't mean that I know and understand all of the world's science and evidence in that space. But what I have seen, I am pretty good at that. And what and I do look at that. And what I have seen is that we don't know yet. Hate to tell you that. I think you need to experiment yourself to see what helps you the most. Um, you'll hear some people say, uh, for example, Jason Fung will say, oh, you know, uh, be careful with protein because it stimulates insulin. Although true, it's not as, sig I don't think it's as significant as Fung says. I'm a big Jason Fung fan, by the way, but I don't agree with everything he says, like that one item. How important is calorie intake? Thanks. Calorie intake at the end of the day is very important, believe it or not. You know, the keto crowd will say it's not. Here's one of the reasons why you get that confusion. This is a seven blind men in the elephant issue where one's saying he's like a snake, the other one's saying like he's a palm tree, or and the third one's saying he's like a wall. The one feeling the, the stomach is saying he's a wall. The one feeling the leg is saying he's a palm tree. And the one feeling the trunk is saying it's a snake. When you are gaining or losing weight, the number of calories that you bring in, as we talked about in this, these two calorie models, the energy balance model, or, or these weight management models, the energy balance model and the, the um, insulin model, energy balance is important for both of them. But here's where the other side of that argument comes in, that debate. When somebody goes on a keto diet, you really don't care. You don't focus and you tell them not to focus that much on the calories in the beginning. Once they get used to keto, once they get past that keto flu and all of that, calories and portion size becomes an issue. But in the very beginning, you get somebody on keto and most folks are going to lose weight, whether they're thinking they're eating a lot or not. Why is that? Because we tend to go by our body's signals when you, you change your diet from standard uh, American diet with a lot of carb, when you change your diet from 200 carbs a day down to less than 100, you're going to think you're eating a lot because your hunger uh, signals are being turned off. Your internal hun hunger signals are turned off. So you're eating a lot when you're saying, I'm not really hungry. The reality is you're still not getting as many car uh, calories as you thought you were. Terry Dixon, thank you for joining. Melissa, what dose of Crestor do you recommend once someone has an MI? Still uh, five or less per day. I'm seeing my cardiologist today and I'm currently on 80 milligrams of Lipitor. Oh. But want to switch to Crestor. You know, one of the things I would suggest, Melissa, is that you, again, go back to the very beginning, find what's causing your your heart risk issue and the MI, the heart attack that you had, and you and your, 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 you, because your doc are probably thinking it's LDL. So that's why he's just hammering the heck out of your lipid, you know, your cholesterol mechanisms with 80 milligrams of Crestor. That's not really going to fix your problem if you have undiagnosed diabetes or prediabetes, and that's really causing the issue. So Get an insulin survey, please. And then that changes the discussion incredibly once you realize you're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, desivity, desitivity. My CRP, C-reactive protein, has been up many times over the, over the years. Since I have to rely on my, uh, I think you're meaning internal medicine and cardiologists for now. 
are there blood tests on inflammation and or others I should take annually or quarterly? Yes, I would take them quarterly. That's what I routinely recommend. And I'm going to give you a what, 15 to 30 second uh, version of our course on cardiovascular inflammation. So what I would suggest more than anything is that you get the course. We also have series uh, on this as well, the inflammation panel. C-reactive protein, microalbumin creatinine ratio, and there was a question about that earlier in this show. Um, LP little a, I mean, uh, plaque 2 LPPLA2. That's an enzyme released by our immune system cells when we are attacking our own plaque and taking friendly fire. And then myeloperoxidase, MPO. That's another enzyme released by another group of uh, immune cells that's also attacking plaque if you have inflammation going on. So one more time real quick. Most of all, get the course or look at the series. It's there. You may think I'm trying, you know, I'm going too fast and it's because I'm trying to cover too much content in too little time because you're asking. So C-reactive protein, my, um, microalbumin creatinine ratio, LPPLA2, plaque two, also known as plaque two, and MPO, myeloperoxidase. Jimmy, at Melissa, normally the Crestor dose is half of what Lipitor is, so at your current Lipitor dose, you should take 40, milli crest, 40 milligrams of Crestor. Well, again, seven blind men and the elephant. Uh, he's looking at the trunk. I'm looking at the wall, and I would say... That's only if you're trying to beat up on your cholesterol. And he's right about Crestor being half the dose of Lipitor. But what we're forgetting, Jimmy, is that it's probably not being caused by her cholesterol. It's The risk is probably being caused by an undiagnosed uh, glucose metabolism problem. <laughs> Melissa... By the way, my CT calcium score was 23 in January and I had an MI in July. So the test is definitely not a good test since it didn't pick up soft plaque. It, so Melissa, again, I hate to keep saying this, but seven blind men and the elephant, I see a very different thing. I think if you have a calcium score of one, we now know that you have plaque we now know that you have risk and we now know that you could have a heart attack. Guess what? I did a video and this was what, three or four months ago. When you study plaque and cardiovascular risk the way I do, you, you always had a concern that, what if your calcium score is zero, but you've got soft plaque? You know, that really became an issue in 2018 when the American Heart Association said, look, it doesn't matter what your cholesterol is. If you don't have plaque, you don't need a statin. Now, I say that and, you know, it's like, hey, they're finally getting it. But here's where the, they made a mistake. And then they said, so if you've got a zero calcium score, you don't need a, cal you don't need a statin. What they were forgetting is, well, maybe you have a zero calcium score, but still have soft plaque. Well, guess what? A couple of months ago, I, I found that there was a study that, that looked at exactly what I was bringing up. Risk for heart attack, even with a zero calcium score. And guess what? It's there. So as you can see, Melissa, yeah, I, I'm not a major fan. I, I'm a bigger fan of calcium score than I am stress tests, obviously from the spiel I gave a few minutes ago. But I interpret a calcium score slightly differently from the way you do. You and I do agree on a couple of things, though. One is that um, it's not the best test. And number two, it's not the best test because it doesn't show you uh, soft plaque. Um, you remember I was having the, the word finding moment problem uh, back when I was talking about you do that calculator. What is that calculator? I can't remember. It's before you say 
you know, your doc says, well, he's a 65 year old non-smoker, et cetera. Framingham. That was the word I was looking for. So thank you for your patience with me as I stumble around my words. Brendan Lenane wondered what your thoughts were on the problematic effects of high oxalate foods, such as kale, spinach, and almonds on cardiac health, especially regarding plaque. Is coronary plaque calcium oxalate? So I want coronary plaque to become calcified. When it becomes calcified, that's a good thing because it's stable at that point. Thank you, Aspen, for showing that Prevention Myths book. Go back and read that book. Now, Brendan, the other question is, well, you know, you got oxalates and kale, spinach, and almonds. I'll tell you what, I, I, I understand your point, and I, I think, and I get the point that there may be some risk, but it's sort of like saying, uh, well, there's risks to walking down the sidewalk because a driver could jump over into the sidewalk and run you over. So what do you think about that risk? Meanwhile, you've got people that are driving down the highway at 110 miles an hour and don't have a speedometer and they're looking at their cell phone and they've had drinks. I am far more concerned about the major risk associated with driving too fast under the influence looking at your uh, at your cell phone. Now, wh what the heck am I talking about? I'm talking about what you're talking about here. Kale is an eating kale and spinach and almonds are analogous, uh, analogous to walking down the sidewalk. Yes, there's some risk, but the risk is minimal compared to what I usually see the vast majority of the population who's, a, who's, continuing to follow their um, misdirected primary care practitioner in terms of looking at LDL only and not getting an insulin survey. So that's the concern. I would say, please, on a population-wide basis, that may be a risk, but on that population-wide basis, it's very minimal compared to the problem with people not knowing how they metabolize carbs. Sam Mirzakanian, Mirzakanian, Mirzakanian. Dr. Brewer, I learned a lot from you and I am thankful for all your information you provided. God bless you. Thank you so much, Sam. I do appreciate that acknowledgement. It's a very um, fulfilling, gratifying work. Um, very happy with it. LPG123, $10. Dr. Brewer, what are your thoughts on JOOVV red light therapy panels and their ability to increase the number of mitochondria and boost their function in the cell? LPG, you know, you're good at coming up with some things that I haven't seen or studied. Uh, I haven't studied red light therapy yet in terms of its impact on mitochondria. Desitivity. Doc, what's your opinion on galactin control as Dr. Isaac Elias promotes? And what about taking citrus pectin? I read a little bit about galactins for a while. And again, uh, I would give a thousand galactin studies for just one insulin survey. Again, I, 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 you both have brought up items that I haven't studied um, much or haven't studied much and or recently. And part of the reason is when I've looked at them before, I just did not get a whole lot of urgency that this is killing people on a mass basis like glucose problems, carb metabolism problems is doing. It is the number one killer. It's the Jack the Ripper in our population. And it's killing so many people. There's not even stories about it anymore. We just accept people to get killed by this. Mutant RAF is about 50-50 male or female unless you are woke. Okay, here we go into totally unrelated political stuff. Thank you, mutant, but not interested. Brad, $20. My, my health care team, thank you, Brad, by the way. My health care team consists of several doctors on the internet and my primary care doctor. B 
but you have the number influence on my approach to treatment. Been with you from the old days of holding up a piece of paper. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for the comment. And here's the way, as you can tell, I'm not technically very good. I didn't really even know how to do PowerPoint when I started. And so I would just print something out and then I'd hold the picture in front of the thing and point at it and talk about it. But the content, it was good and people received it very well. And here we are just in a four or five years later, 120,000 uh, subscribers and uh, having a lot of fun and saving a lot of lives. Thank you so much, Brad. I appreciate the comment. If you're in the U S and, and uh, eligible for Medicare at some point, uh, tell us which state you are and see if we can get geared up with you. Jimmy, my triglycerides dropped from 120 milligrams in August to 55 in late September. Congratulations. That is a very good development. The only thing different I did during that time was change my brands of fish oil and probiotics. Was it the fish oil? <sighs> Possibility. I won't say no, but I'd be very surprised. I'm very skeptical and that would just be weird. Now, I mean, now I, let me back off. Maybe that wouldn't be that weird. You know, you do get significant improvement in, uh, triglycerides and it is associated with fish oil you know amarin is the group that's making a ton of money now off of uh, uh what is it and i remembered amarin now i can't remember oh wait a minute it is uh something that uh it's it's a mashup of uh omega the uh, omega-3 and vask uh Elevask, no. Somebody remind me what Amarin makes. They're making a ton of money and they're doing well. And basically what they're looking at is a type of fish oil, an omega-3 oil, um, and uh, EPA. So e EPA, Epivask, something like that. Um, that's their new drug. And it's a very, it's a pharmaceutical grade um, EPA, omega-3, and it gets rid of the, uh, the other uh, omega-3 oils because their opinion is that the other omega-3 oils actually compete with the, um, with the EPA. So I'll take that back. Uh, that's not as goofy or not as unusual as I might think. Here's part of my problem. The, the, the supplemental uh, omega threes have been around forever, and they just none of them have had that kind of impact that I'm, I'm that I'm aware of. Bart Robinson, Jimmy, may I ask a brand of fish oil, please? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. Uh, Vas Vasipa, I had the I had the uh, the names wrong. Yes, it does have EPA and it does have Vask in it. And I kept trying to fit EPA VASC, EPA VASC. It's not EPA VASC, it's VASC EPA, VASCEPA. And VASCEPA is doing a very good job, by the way. I'm not plugging that any more than I would plug uh, GLP1s or SGLT2s. You know, when something works, it works. Jimmy, designs for health, Omega Avail Synergy, Omega Complex for adults. You know, Jimmy makes, I'm sort of like Bart. I think, hmm. Maybe I should try that. Omega-3, 6, 7, 9, fatty acids from borage and macadamia oil. I don't know. What's borage? Triglyceride fish oil with DHA and EPA, 180 soft gels. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Let's see how we, oh my gosh, we've got a lot of comments. Don't, I'm not going to get to all of them. But we'll get to as many as we can. Leo Acapulco, good to hear from you, Leo. We've uh, missed you. Buenos dias, Dr. Brewer. Buenos dias a ti, Leo. I just got my COVID bivalent and the flu shots, all for science. Muchas gracias, Leo. Doctors Muscleholic, waiting for you to talk about obesity. Um. 
Don't know exactly how to take that. If you're saying the we, that we didn't talk about obesity uh, or that that was a clickbait kind of, and I hope you're not saying that. Um, as I said, coming up with titles is difficult. I wouldn't have used that title even if I were looking for clickbait. But maybe you're maybe you're saying something else. If you could be a little bit more specific, I'd be happy to to uh, mention it or or deal with it. Melissa, what's your opinion about eating eggs early and often? Uh, they're good for you. There's so much conflicting evidence out there about eggs. Mm -mm, I don't agree. I think the evidence is pretty clear. Eggs are good for you. John Tocho, I read Metabolical by Robert Lustig. Very good book. Lustig is a very good author. He's a very good speaker. Uh, I'm a big Robert Lustig fan. And that doesn't mean that I agree with everything he says, but he's really good. Big fan. Fort Worth, West Side. If most studies are flawed, how do you know which ones to trust then? You know, that's a great question in terms of logic. My point is, caveat emptor, be careful just taking a study, looking at the title and thinking, well, that's truth because Wall Street Journal published it and they are good. Well, we all know they're not They're, You know, they have some good folks. New York Times has some good uh, editors. And you say, well, wait a minute. I know that the uh, editors or art uh, uh, writers, science, the medical writers for New York Times are doctors. They are and they're good ones. But that doesn't mean they're always the greatest epidemiologists. Caveat emptor, buyer beware. Look at the information. Listen to other people uh, as they talk about information and begin to, begin to parse it out. So, for example, actually, one of the things, speaking of that latter item, for example, I'll look at, I got a lot of my uh, early concerns about the vital study from listening to Peter Atia and some other folks. He was very good in that space. But as I mentioned before, Peter uh, looks at some other stuff and doesn't have some enough criticism or skepticism like this stuff about ApoB. Um, it wasn't that there was a study for him to react to. And, you know, it was the his guests. He's had guests on that talk about it. So bottom line is be careful and look at the logic Listen to other intelligent people that do this very well, that that look at bias, that look skeptically at research. Be skeptical. Fort Worth, good question. I hope that helped. If it didn't, and there's more I can do, let me know. Uh, of course, so many summaries of studies are written by ghostwriters, not the actual researchers. Summary statements are many are, are different info than the actual body of the report. That's, I think what you're talking about is what I was saying. You know, you go to, New, uh, to, to uh, New York Times or these other lay press items. They may have been written by a, a physician who happens to be a, um, oh, what do you call it? A journalist. That still doesn't, I mean, just being a physician doesn't make you a great epidemiologist. 99.9%, .9%, and that's my reaction. I haven't taken a study. But I would say 99.9% .9 of physicians are really bad epidemiologists. They don't know how to look at a study. They just quote them. Unfortunately, you know, things like Framingham, they think they know, and they really don't. And so... You know, there was a boatload of confusion about, oh, so don't take aspirin anymore. It's not, we don't recommend it for primary prevention. That's not, you know, that again, buyer beware, caveat emptor, even the groups, the standards committees, like the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force was saying primary prevention. Primary prevention means you don't have the disease yet. What about people that have plaque? By definition, if you have plaque, you have cardiovascular disease. So I, I had, I've had, had and seen so many people with cardiovascular disease and plaque read those 
uh, New York Times articles about the U.S. Preventive Services Task Forces and the other groups saying, oh, you don't need to take aspirin anymore. And these people with plaque were stopping their baby aspirin. Uh, you just be careful. Find people that know what they're doing and listen to them. Keto by George at Fort Worth West Side. Excellent question. I hope I dealt with it. I'm seeing a lot of, I agree. I mean, these are very, very important issues. Speaking of something important, Bobby Ocampo from the Milo, uh, Milipine, from the Philippines, Mabuhay, Magandang, Buhay. And Aspen, Gilbert taught me what that meant. I, I think he said something like, live a long, happy, beautiful life. Is that correct? Yes, Doc. Thank you very much, Aspen. So Mabuhay, Magandang, Buhay to you as well, Bobby and to the other listeners for today. Would you, uh, desitivity is the last one because I'm going to have to to run. Would you explain the relationship between ApoB100 and LP little a? Thanks. I'm not going to get into the distinction of ApoB100, but I will talk about ApoB versus LP little a. Let's go back further. And I keep this at, as you see, I just reached over and I got it. What is this? It looks sort of like a water bottle, but it's got some sort of oil in it, doesn't it? It does. Olive oil. That olive oil, you know, people talk about it. You're not going to find a lot of people saying olive oil is, is unhealthy. You'll find a few. But so let's say you eat that with a salad. Most people would say good olive oil, good salad. It's a good meal, healthy meal. That can kill you because you see oil doesn't mix with water, right? How does the body, so if you mix it up, now that is healthier because the oil is distributed in a whole bunch of microscopic particles. It's not going to block an artery. When you get big blobs like this, it will block an artery and give you a heart attack, stroke, you know, just like a clot will. In fact, both of them are called embolism. An embolus is a blob of something that can stop the blood flow when it blocks an artery. There are the two most common types of embolism are a clot embolism. The clot embolism happens when you have a heart attack. And it happens when you have inflammation and your body releases a soft plaque. That's what causes heart attacks, by the way. There's another type of embolism, and it happens mostly during surgery and especially after major trauma. For example, if somebody's in a car wreck and they break both femurs, you know, the pelvis, what happens is that the blobs of fat in the, um, in the bone marrow get released and they'll go out like that and block off arteries. <clears throat> Uh, that's why people end up, you know, with multiple broken bones, end up in the ICU and having major tissue damage. So what does the body do to stop when I eat a salad to stop me from getting this and having fat emboli? It forms proteins. Proteins are our body's way of solving the vast majority of problems that it has. So it has this problem. There are proteins that will take up tiny bits of this and turn them into a particle. Those proteins, there are two types of proteins for the most, there are multiple types, but there are two major ones. One uh, pulls in a lot of fat and therefore there's a lot of fat, not as much protein. So it's lower density. It floats more and it's called low density lipoprotein. You might have remember it from its acronym, LDL. It used to be thought of as, quote, bad cholesterol. The other major kind is HDL. It holds less fat, and it has, therefore, more protein, less fat, higher density lipoprotein, HDL. Now, if you're saying, what's this got to do with this question? I'm getting there. I'm almost there. Just be patient with me as we go through the bunny hole. ApoB is the protein that forms LDL. ApoA1 is the protein. <clears throat> the pro excuse me, the protein that forms LDL, 
IDL, the remnant cholesterols, <clears throat> and the other uh, LDL particles, lipoprotein particles. <clears throat> so now we have described what ApoB is. What's LP little a? LP little a is ApoB with some genetically driven <clears throat> variations. It has a a a repeat um, amino acid that forms what we call the Kringle repeats. People used to think, well, maybe that's a hook that causes this extra risk of heart attack that you get with APO, with LP little a. Uh, others would say, no, it's not that Kringle repeat hook causing the problem. It is the fact that it just tends to bring in more small, dense, oxidized LDL or uh, cholesterol. <clears throat> the bottom line is we don't know yet. I, I tend to lean a little bit towards the latter, but the evidence, again, is not there. And if you see somebody at this point in time telling you that it is, be skeptical. Be very, very skeptical. I didn't even get into the questions of, you know what, maybe these are all biomarkers, uh, LDL, HDL, and even LP little a, and maybe they're actually helping uh, respond to other risk factors, other sources of inflammation. There's a lot to be said for that one, that theory, but that would take a lot more time than I have today. Thank you so much for, for joining. If we were unable to get to your comment, you just got to get those comments in earlier. We've only got so much time uh, when we do the Q&A. Thank you again, and we'll see you next week.